On May 27, 1968, the USS Scorpion and its 99-man crew failed to return to Norfolk. She had likely vanished into the deep on May 22nd, shortly after her last transmission late on May 20th into May 21st. For months, the Navy mounted a massive search, publicly holding out hope. Yet in the background, analysts were studying classified SOSIS recordings from May 22nd that suggested a catastrophic event at sea. Those signals raised a harder question than most expected. Was the end an explosion or an implosion? The answer would come not from rumor, but from the ocean floor, and it would shape the search that followed. Meanwhile, the search that everyone could see unfolded across the Atlantic, while a quieter effort guided the decisions behind it. During the peak days from May 28th to May 30th, as many as 55 ships and 35 aircraft scoured the ocean. Yet the real analysis took place in a secure facility, where specialists worked with a classified SOSUS recording from May 22. Those hydrophones had captured a sequence of 15 acoustic events over roughly 190 seconds, brief bursts and low-frequency energy that pointed to a sudden, violent end. This evidence introduced an immediate dilemma. The data suggested a probable location about 400 nautical miles southwest of the Azores and indicated a catastrophic failure at depth. But disclosing how that inference was made risked exposing the existence and capability of the SOSUS network, a critical Cold War asset built to track Soviet submarines. Reports and later accounts suggest this concern shaped what could be shared publicly and when. The official search was therefore informed, if not explicitly defined, by what those classified analyses implied. The Navy employed Bayesian search theory, a statistical method, to steer ships and aircraft toward the most promising zones. Guided by mathematicians and by John Pena Craven, the chief scientist of the Navy's Special Projects Division, planners updated probability maps as new data arrived. The public effort stayed broad enough to appear conventional, while the most sensitive inferences remained restricted to a small circle. Families waited as days turned to weeks. The ocean gave up little, but the probability contours tightened. In late October 1968, the oceanographic research ship USNS Mizar towed a camera sled across a narrow swath of seabed in the target area. Its images confirmed what analysts had modeled. The debris lay at roughly 9,800 feet. The hull shattered and sealed in silence. In many ways, it was not a discovery so much as a verification, physical proof aligning with months of guarded assessments. With a position fixed and images in hand, investigators could finally shift from sound to steel. What the cameras revealed on the bottom would define the next phase of the inquiry. From the first useful passes over the seabed, the imagery pointed to a hull that had failed under pressure and come apart in the descent. The wreck was not a single coherent structure. The submarine had broken into two large sections, separated by a field of scattered debris. Structural failure centered in and around the operations compartment, with collapse beginning near frame 33 and propagating aft toward the conical to cylindrical transition around frame 67. Hydrostatic pressure broke the boat in two, cleanly separating the forward part of the pressure hull from the engineering spaces and stern. This fracture pattern was inconsistent with a massive external implosion which would have produced a bubble pulse and far more chaotic disintegration. Instead, the separation pointed toward uniform sea pressure, overwhelming the structure. The evidence pointed toward an implosion at roughly 1,530 feet. As the engineering section collapsed, the engine room telescoped about 50 feet forward into the hull. In that inward crush, the propulsion shaft came out of the boat, not as a projectile blast, but as a consequence of the stern structure folding and compressing around it. The operations compartment, located amidships, showed the most severe damage. It was largely obliterated by sea pressure, 
This configuration suggested a clear sequence. The submarine lost buoyancy and descended beyond its structural limits. At critical depth, the pressure hull failed at its weakest transition points, and the final collapse propagated in milliseconds. The forward section told a different story. The bow, including the torpedo room, appeared remarkably intact by comparison. On the bottom, the nose had skidded and plowed a trench in the soft Globigarina ooze, marking the violence of impact. Yet even there, the compartments forward of the sail were preserved enough to map frames and hatches, a contrast that underscored how the aft hull had been destroyed by pressure rather than by an internal detonation. The wreckage did not name the initiating fault, but it mapped the last minutes of the boat's life with forensic clarity. Out a broad class of explosive scenarios and narrowed attention to how water, pressure, and structure interacted as the descent accelerated. One space in particular stood out amid the ruin, raising a new line of questions that investigators could not ignore. The torpedo room paradox sat at the bow, where the evidence seemed to contradict the violence visited on the rest of the hull. The condition of the torpedo room became the focal point for investigators reconstructing the sequence of Scorpion's destruction. Despite the catastrophic implosion that shattered the aft sections, the torpedo room was intact though it had been pinched by excessive sea pressure. Its structure was preserved, but with one critical component missing, the forward hatch on the escape trunk. This was not a minor detail, but a central clue. The hatch was not merely damaged, it was gone, scavenged from its hinges by the immense force of the sea. According to submarine structures expert Peter Palermo, this would have occurred when water pressure entered the torpedo room at the moment of implosion. The room had already been flooded, equalizing internal and external pressure. The hatch, not designed to withstand that external load path, was simply forced off. This forensic observation effectively ruled out a torpedo detonation inside the room as the initial cause. An internal explosion would have obliterated the space from the inside out leaving a very different pattern of destruction. The Structural Analysis Group, which included the Naval Ship Systems Command's Submarine Structures Director, reached the same conclusion. The torpedo room's state supported a broader finding. The hull was crushed by implosion forces as it sank below crush depth. That pointed away from a primary explosive trigger in the bow and toward a flooding-driven loss of buoyancy that began elsewhere. The evidence instead pointed to a flooding event that started outside the torpedo room. Seawater, entering through a failure in another compartment, would have propagated forward, filling connected spaces and making the submarine increasingly heavy. The descent accelerated into the pressure zone the structure could not survive. In that final plunge, the stern collapsed catastrophically, while the flooded torpedo room, already at ambient pressure, retained its form, pinched, scarred, but still recognizable. The intact bow was not proof of safety, but rather the clearest sign that the disaster's first act unfolded away from the torpedo room. It confirmed that the final violent collapse was the result of an earlier failure that doomed the ship long before the hull reached its limits. With that physical timeline in hand, investigators could now weigh competing explanations against what the wreck itself recorded. Against that backdrop, the debate narrowed to what the theories could actually explain when set beside the steel. Each hypothesis had to account for the acoustic record and the specific damage pattern on the seafloor. The Naval Ordnance Laboratory's assessment is blunt. The first Scorpion acoustic event was not caused by a large explosion either internal or external to the hull. And it is very unlikely that any of the Scorpion acoustic events were caused by explosions. That finding undercuts both external attack scenarios and claims of a dominant internal blast. The hydrogen explosion theory, advanced by retired Rear Admiral Dave Oliver and acoustics analyst Bruce Rule, posits a battery compartment event to explain an early, smaller signal. It offers a candidate source for noise, but struggles with the required sequence. 
a localized hydrogen burn or pop in the battery well could damage equipment. Yet it does not by itself create the rapid, submarine-wide flooding needed to drive an uncontrolled descent. To crush depth. Torpedo-related theories gained traction because of real concerns with batteries. The Mark 37's components were prone to overheating, and Mark 46 silver-zinc batteries had a tendency to overheat and, in extreme cases, could cause a fire strong enough to produce a low-order detonation of the warhead. Even so, the wreck does not show the telltale internal overpressure damage a warhead event would leave in the bow. The torpedo room was intact, pinched, and flooded before the final collapse. That state, and the Naval Ordnance Laboratory's acoustic judgment, weighs against a high-energy torpedo explosion as the initiating cause. The trash disposal unit malfunction theory aligns more closely with the observed flooding path. A failure of the TDU, a large overboard discharge valve near the center of the boat, could admit seawater directly into machinery spaces. That mechanism explains the rapid loss of buoyancy, the propagation of flooding through connected compartments, and the relatively preserved bow. The popular Soviet attack narrative fits neither the physics nor the tactics. There are no weapon impact signatures on the hull, and a single external hit would not produce the observed sequence. As U.S. Navy submarine captain Robert Lagasse put it, no Soviet submarine in 1968 could detect, track, approach, and attack any skipjack or later class U.S. submarine. The Court of Inquiry never endorsed a single cause. Its findings of fact, released in 1993, listed several torpedo-related scenarios among possibilities, underscoring the unresolved trigger, even as the end state is clear. What remains, then, is a divided story, one part cause, one part consequence, waiting to be weighed for what it teaches. What the evidence leaves, the record must carry forward, a clear end state and a duty to remember. The story of the USS Scorpion is not one mystery, but two. The wreckage at 9,800 feet answers the second. Her final moments were an implosion under pressure, not a blast. That clarity places her alongside USS Thresher as one of only two nuclear submarine. The submarine remains a protected war grave. The Navy periodically revisits the site, about 400 nautical miles southwest of the Azores, to check for disturbance and to sample for any release from the reactor or two nuclear-tipped torpedoes. Environmental reports find no uranium above levels expected from historic atmospheric fallout. She was the second nuclear submarine the Navy lost, and the last. <laughs>